Members, members of the Presidential Task Force, there are Nigerians watching us from different parts of the country. Gentlemen of the press, a very good evening. Today is Monday, 27th July, 2020, and I welcome you to the regular national briefing by the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19. We'll make it a very brisk uh, business this afternoon, as we do not want to run into uh, the news belt time so that you can file all your reports properly. So we'll manage the time properly. We'll be maintaining the same format, but before I invite the chairman of the PTF, let me inform you that we have a guest in-house today. He's attending for the first time. He's Dr. Walter Kazadi Mulombo, the country representative of the WHO. You're welcome to Nigeria and welcome to the national briefing. At this point, let me invite the chairman of the PTF to come up to the podium for his remarks, after which we shall take the technical updates from the Minister of Health, the DG and CDC, and the national coordinator in that order. The chairman, sir. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen of the press, I welcome you all to the national briefing by the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 for Monday, 27th July, 2020. But let me also particularly welcome Dr. Walter Kasadi Molumbo, the WHO rep in Nigeria, who is attending this press briefing for the very first time. You are welcome, sir. Thank you so much for coming. And to thank you for all the efforts and support we'll be receiving from the WHO. That's Fiona's colleague here in Nigeria. You will recall that we briefed the nation on the 29th of June, 2020, sequel to the approval of Mr. President for the extension of phase two of the eased lockdown for another four weeks. That extension is due to expire on Wednesday, 29 July 2020, having commenced on the 30th of June 2020. The Presidential Task Force has continued to evaluate the developments as well as the level of compliance nationwide and has regrettably come to the inevitable conclusion that majority of Nigerians irrespective of status, creed, and level of education continue to live in denial on the virulent nature of the virus and consistently breach the guidelines and non-pharmaceutical measures put in place. We informed you two weeks ago that the process of submitting the sixth interim report and recommendations for next steps had commenced. The Presidential Task Force has reached advanced stages of the process. It has also considered that due to the upcoming Salah Eid al Kabir festivities, which coincide with the expiration of the current phase, it will be prudent to extend by one week from 29th July till Thursday, 6th August, 2020. It has accordingly secured permission to retain the existing guidelines till that date. Considering the importance of international air travel to the economy, the Presidential Task Force and the aviation sector are working hard to fast track reopening of the international airspace. Most importantly, 
the arrival protocols for passengers on inbound flights are being firmed up for seamless testing and detection. Relevant MDAs will be holding further consultations. The COVID-19 remains very virulent and very dangerous. Current statistics show the following. Global cases recorded now stands at 16,380,309 cases from 215 countries and territories. Global deaths stand at 651,198, while global recoveries stand at about 10 million recoveries. On the continent of Africa, cases are, as of today, 848,771 cases, death toll 17,791, and about half a million recoveries. In Nigeria, cases, as of today, stand at 40,532 cases with fatalities of 858, while about 17,000 recoveries. The WHO statistics show that on the 24th July 2020, the world recorded 284,000 plus confirmed cases and 9,750 deaths. Both were records in terms of the spike in the daily numbers, and they represent a lead flag to all nations. That in spite of almost six months of tackling COVID-19, an investment in billions or trillions of dollars, we still recorded the highest number on the 24th of July. And that's a clear picture of what is confronting the entirety of humanity. Our analysis has shown that people over 50 years of age especially those with underlying factors remain most at risk. This position is backed by the fact that 65% of fatalities recorded in Nigeria are in this category. So if you take the figure of 558 fatalities in Nigeria, 65% of these fatalities fall between the age bracket of 50 and above. That brings me to the need to appeal to Nigerians on the need for a change of behavior and compliance with measures put in place. If you do not need to go outside your home, Please stay indoors. If you do not need to attend any occasion, avoid large gatherings and observe all the measures that have been introduced. In recent times, our risk communication teams have developed messages aimed at resonating very well with different demographic groups. The common string is the message for compliance and the proper wearing of face masks and coverings in public spaces. The national coordinator would elaborate further on this. Yesterday being Sunday, I decided to just drive outside the city of Abuja for the second time again. And this time, instead of going to the Kuje area, I decided to go to the Karu. Nyanya, Jukoi, Aurozo, Eira. And to my utter disappointment, 
people are just moving around as if there is nothing like COVID-19. I think that of Kuja was even better. I saw three people wearing masks, two, <laughs> two wearing them inappropriately under their chin, with only one that had it properly worn. That of Karu, Jukoi, Orozo area. People were just on their own, doing whatever they wanted to do with themselves in total disregard for the non-pharmaceutical measures that have been put in place. And we are at the stage of community transmission. I believe the national coordinator will be elaborating further on the need for strict adherence to this compliance, I mean to these measures that have been put in place. As we prepare for the Eid al-Kabir first celebration, we also want to urge all our Muslim brothers and sisters and indeed all Nigerians to continue to observe all measures. We note with delight the increasing number of states that have shelved activities during this Salah celebration. And we still urge others yet to do so to follow suit. The World Health Organization has also introduced self-aid practices in the context of COVID-19, and I urge us all to access and disseminate this information. I believe the National Coordinator will further elaborate on this as he gives his update. Similarly, the Presidential Task Force appreciates the Nigeria Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs who has always been a great champion in the fight against the pandemic for advising Muslims to avoid massive gatherings at aid grounds and pray at area mosques under prescribed protocols. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to inform you that the Presidential Task Force is making steady progress in bringing more states within the national network and reporting system. This will greatly enhance the outcome of COVID-19 national response and will be more beneficial to the citizens of those states and the country in general. I now invite the Honorable Minister of Health, the DG, Nigerian Center for Disease Control, and the National Coordinator to the PTF to present their updates and thereafter, we'll have certain interventions by honorable ministers here. I thank you for listening. Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 Response, Secretary of Government, honorable ministers, the permanent, permanent secretaries, the national coordinator, the DG, directors and ladies and gentlemen here present. May I also join in welcoming our colleague, Dr. Walter Kazadi Mulongbo, who is our new uh, WHO country representative to Nigeria and assumed duty about uh, two weeks ago and familiarizing himself still with this terrain. The total number of confirmed COVID-19 cases in Nigeria crossed the 40,000 mark to 40,534 over the weekend, with 555 new cases recorded in the past 24 hours. And on the whole, 17,000 374 persons have been successfully treated and discharged from hospital. We have regrettably lost a total of 858 persons, most of them with comorbidities. With 262,579 persons 
tested so far. We have crossed the quarter million mark. And as you know, we are heading for the two million mark. When the epidemic curve will begin to flatten is still a matter of conjecture, given the relatively small fraction of our population that has so far been tested. It is our plan and our endeavor that our health system be not challenged beyond what it can bear. A 60 PCR uh, public health laboratories are now active in Nigeria and together should be in a position to address the testing capacity challenges and ramp up utilization if the logistics are able to get proper improvement. This would, along with the sheer community spread, be responsible for the rising trajectory of the, of the epidemic curve in the population so far tested. The 70 to 30 male to female gender ratio and the case fatality in our country of 21% have not changed significantly. But two thirds of all fatalities remain in the over 50 year old group, while comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, asthma are common among all fatalities. They underscore the need, as we have always said, and I repeat again today, that we need to protect senior citizens and the vulnerable from infection by giving special attention to risk communication targeted at them. Again, I say we give priority for admission, for observation and treatment so that complications can be easily detected and attended to before they blow into out of proportion. Of utmost concern are still our young our asymptomatic cases with the potential to spread this disease while themselves being quite well, and of whom uh, the young and able-bodied can be difficult to manage. We see that in other countries too, where there can be resistance to efforts to control this disease working with the population. But it is clear that success in managing COVID-19 will depend on a very strong relationship between the governing and the governed and the strong collaboration of citizens with laid down rules and recommendations. We continue to strive to improve the quality of service in our hospitals as more persons are admitted to treatment. But this time, not only for COVID-19 infection, but for routine and essential care. It is our desire to reduce fatality rates, as I've said, expand treatment capacities, such that our health system cannot get overwhelmed. In this regard, the Federal Ministry of Health expects to take delivery of a newly completed isolation center at the uh, University of Abuja Teaching Hospital, Guagualada, uh, very soon, just as other centers are under construction nationwide. So we are expanding our bed spaces and our capacity to admit in expectation, as we have always said, uh, being able to prepare for the worst and strive for the best. The UN system in Nigeria has informed us of the arrival of another consignment of essential COVID-19 related commodities yesterday to be officially handed over to us soon. We remain appreciative of the UN system for this gesture and their consistent support, which greatly increases our reserves and recognizes our needs especially of oxygen concentrators and personal protective equipment, but also reassures our frontline health workers that we are well stocked and can ensure availability of essential items 
and consumables at point of use. I also use the opportunity to salute our frontline health workers whose service helps to reduce fatality and urge them to continue their work in line with global best practices, increased management, and to keep themselves safe and take no risks in the course of rendering service. Coronavirus does not respect doctors or nurses. As this holiday period approaches, I want to wish again our Muslim brethren happy celebration and enjoin all persons not to forget the prescribed precautions and to reduce the risks of transmission, even as we celebrate. Very simple. Wear your mask at all times, especially when out of your home. Wash your hands regularly. Use sanitizers. Practice distancing. I remind everyone that controlling the spread of COVID-19 is not the responsibility of government alone, but of all of us individually and collectively. No one should think that they are immune to this dangerous infection, and everyone should bear in mind that they are their neighbor's keeper, and their, keep, their neighbor will also protect them. Thank you for your attention. Read to the Government of the Federation, Honorable Ministers, uh, Honorable Minister for Transport, uh, WR, thank you very much, gentlemen of the press. And my comments today will be very brief. I think the issues have been flogged very hard. We crossed a number of very important milestones last week. 16 million cases worldwide. 16 million cases worldwide, 640 deaths, 40,000 cases in Nigeria, just under 1,000 deaths. So anyone that is still not taking this disease seriously can only have himself or herself to blame. But really, I just wanted to share a few words around risk perception. And the more common something is, the tendency is that we take it a little bit more lightly. And just like the Secretary to the Government of the Federation mentioned today, it's increasingly alarming the rate and the risk, high risk behaviors that we continue to carry out across the country. Yes, Mr. President agreed to ease some of the lockdown measures, not because we wanted to, but, but because we had to, because we had to stay alive. But to stay alive, we also have to do some basics. Wearing a mask, wearing a mask might seem very cumbersome, but I promise you, it's less cumbersome than being on a ventilator. It's less cumbersome than being on a ventilator. Over the last few weeks, many of you would have heard stories, stories of survivors. But there are many stories that could have been told that you have not heard, stories of those that have passed away. Many of us have become desensitized about the messages because we say them so often, over and over again, for the past six months. Even for us coming out here every day to speak, sometimes it is a challenge having to say the same things over and over again, asking all of us to take responsibility, to do the best that we can. So, we continue to do that, recognizing the efforts of many frontline health workers across the country that are working every day. As we intensify our risk communication efforts and messages, try different techniques, use different media,
try and say the same things using different means, different words, the message is still the same. We must do our best to protect each other. Nigeria is an incredibly large country. No one, of, no one person can do this, carry out this fight on our own. It really requires all of us to work together. So please, I urge all of us not to throw caution to the winds, to keep taking responsibility, and together we will win this fight eventually. Thank you very much. The task force, um, honorable ministers, uh, members of the PTF, uh, gentlemen of the press, um, good evening. So today I'll be talking about um, the oncoming celebrations of um, Eid al Adha or Eid al Kabir. Uh, the PTF understands that um, Eid al Kabir is a major celebration for Muslims uh, globally. Uh, we would nevertheless want to remind us all that the safety guidelines for the second phase of the ease of lockdown is still in place uh, for the purpose of uh, public safety. In fact, the protocol we have uh, designed with regards to places of worship remains um, effective um, as at the time we opened um, the mosques and churches. Uh, for this reason, the PTF strongly advises against uh, ma mass public gatherings in any form um, safety is important. Infection control measures must be observed in public spaces at all times. We urge states and religious bodies to make specific determination and recommendations regarding Eid congregation in their respective states. As mentioned by the chairman earlier on, uh, we are aware of some states have already uh, put out guidance and for those that have um, uh, restricted um, uh, celebrations, we are grateful for the proactive step they have taken. It's important to note that coronavirus continues to be a significant threat to all of us and to our way of life. We know that it does not discriminate. We know that it doesn't really care whether or not you are celebrating Salah. We are all susceptible and we need to take care. Uh, in terms of the specifics um, I will first of all start with uh, talking about the issue of physical distancing, which needs to be at least a meter between people at all times. Uh, we strongly recommend the mandatory use of face masks and urge authorities to make sure that those persons not wearing face masks are not allowed entry into the places of um, uh, worship, especially during Salah. Strongly recommend Avoiding physical contact. Uh, greetings is a good thing, but you can greet each other by waving, by nodding, or by placing your hand over your heart. Um, we will continue to prohibit large mass gatherings in public spaces, uh, so derbas, street shows, and public gatherings. Uh, we strongly discourage um, social gatherings and family visits, especially by members, um, by friends that are not part of the family um, set up in the household, and particularly as it relates to vulnerable populations like th those above the age of uh, 60 and those with comorbidities. All entertainment venues shall remain closed during the Eid period. Uh, our advice to high-risk groups remains that those above the age of 60 years or have comorbidities should preferably stay at home, and those sick and or having symptoms should not attend the Eid prayers. In terms of mitigation measures when it comes to physical gatherings, uh, we recommend holding the event outdoors for the prayers, if possible, if the weather permits. If it has to be indoors, the numbers should be limited and we must ensure adequate ventilation and airflow. Uh, all events should be shortened to limit potential exposure because the longer you stay within an enclosed environment with an infectious person, the more likely you are to catch it. Total time, including sermons, remain unchanged as per our previous guideline and not to exceed an hour. 
we strongly recommend you, holding smaller services of environment. with fewer attendees or staggering the prayers, I will and particularly making use of neighborhood worship centers rather than large congregations. We advise maintaining physical distancing throughout, including during the period of prayer, during the performance of ablution, etc. Religious authorities are advised to regulate the number and flow of people entering, attending, and departing from worship areas to, and to ensure safe distancing at all times. We expect temperature monitoring as well as arrangements to deal with sick persons and the facilitation of contact tracing if this happens. From the point of view of maintaining a healthy hygiene, um, hand washing facilities must be adequately equipped with soap and water. We strongly advise on the use of alcohol-based hand drops at entrances and inside places of worship and the provision of disposable tissues as well as bins with closed lids to enhance the safe disposal of waste. Uh, where people are attending, preferably attend with your own personal prayer rug to place over carpets. With frequent cleaning of often touched surfaces such as doorknobs, railings, etc. In terms of animal management and marketplace restrictions, since this is Idil Ada, this is Idil Kabir, we'll all be slaughtering rams, we uh, urge the allocation of enough space to keep animals and to avoid overcrowding in anticipation of slaughter. We encourage slaughter at facilities while practicing physical distancing, hand hygiene, and adequate protective measures. Preferably, if it has to be in a home, then preferably um, nominate a household member to perform this and to help with the distribution of food of meat so that we reduce exposure to other members of the family. We certainly discourage overcrowding associated with the distribution of meat and consider physical distancing measures in place. In summary, I would like to echo the statement by the Nigeria Supreme Council of Islamic Affairs released yesterday under the leadership of its President General and Sultan of Sokoto, His Eminence Al Haji Muhammadu Saad Abu Bakr. And I quote We are living in unusual times where normalcy has become abnormal, including social gatherings and large congregational prayers. Muslims are enjoined to note that Eid al Adha is not a compulsory religious activity and should only be observed if security of health of our own lives and as well as our health is maintained. Muslims should continue to act according to the established protocol in their various communities and locations in Nigeria during the forthcoming Eid al Adha. In places where restrictions have been lifted from congregational prayers, Muslims should observe their Eid prayers while still taking necessary safety measures regarding personal hygiene, facial masks, and social distancing. It is even advisable that in such places, massive gatherings at one Eid ground in a big city should be avoided. Rather, the Eid could be performed in area mosques to avoid unmanageable crowds. However, in places where the ban on public congregational prayers and social religious gatherings is still in force, Muslims are directed to be law abiding while appreciating that intentions supersede actions and actions are judged on the basis of intentions." Close quote. We are grateful to the Nigeria Supreme Council of Islamic Affairs for continuing to support our actions against COVID. And we know that this is not yet over. It is not over yet until it is over. Let us try and stay safe and stay alive. Eid Mubarak. Thank you. Members of the Presidential Task Force, my colleagues, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, if you see 
I brought two items. If anybody has ever seen me in public without this, let the person raise his hand. In public without this. I carry this everywhere I go. The reason is I have seen people die of COVID. So I'm dead scared. If you ask the last speaker, I refuse to agree that we should open the railways. It is the pressure of those who want to participate in the forthcoming spiritual activities that made me accept that we open the railway, railways from Abuja to Kaduna. What are your requirements? We don't want to see how handsome you are or how beautiful you are. Please wear for me a face mask. Not a mouth mask. Oh. Nigerians wear mouth mask. They wear this. If you do that, the train will stop and you will come down. There is no Christian, there is no Muslim in death. I hope you know. When you die, you go and face your your God. Exactly. And some of us are not ready to face our creators. So don't take us down there. So the moment you bring down your mask, the police, there are, we have increased the number of policemen in each coach. The police will ask you to wear back your mask for respect. If you refuse, he would ask the driver to stop. Pray we don't stop at Regina. How many of you know Regina? No, that's where they carry people, you know. If it's a Regina, you will come down there. If they carry you, you will come back after the, the spiritual activity. We will allow this type of mask. We will also possibly allow, not possibly, we will allow the cloth mask made by Nigerians. But that's the mask that people put in their mouth. So when you're getting the local, locally made mask, it must be such that covers both nose and mouth. Don't come with face shield. If you want to come with your face shield, don't forget to come with your face mask. You will not enter the station if you don't have a face mask. You will not enter the station if you don't have a hand sanitizer. We must see a hand sanitizer. We must make sure it is not below 79% alcohol. This one is 100% alcohol, 100%. This is not sure. This is methylated spirit and alcohol. But for those of you who can't, this is locally made. For those of you who can't bring alcohol and methylated spirit, come with your, uh, what do you call it, sanitizer that is not below at least 79% alcohol. We will check it. I'm not joking. I'll be there on Wednesday morning, and I'll be there till mid-afternoon. We have reduced, for purpose of physical distancing, the number of passengers. Coaches that convey 88 passengers will not, not convey more than 50 passengers. So uh, you have your space. That's why we increase the transport fare from 1,500 to 3,000 for economy. For business class, 5,000. And for first class, 6,000. First, first class, you don't, know, you don't need social distancing. It's just 23 seats in the coach of 88. So you have enough space. But for economy and business class, you need social, uh, physical distancing or social distancing. And that's why we have created those those spaces. I said mask. I didn't say wrapper. I didn't say cover your face with wrapper. We don't mind you covering your face with wrapper, but we must please show us your mask before you cover fully. Before you, you step in. Inside this waiting room, we don't have enough seats. So if you're not, if you don't have a seat, please wait outside. It will be one bench of three seats to one passenger. No longer three persons. That's what it will be. You may not be allowed to move freely inside the, inside the coaches, except you want to use the toilet. 
apart from using the toilet, you will not be allowed free movement. We are bringing in as many policemen as possible, not only for security, but for enforcement. I don't know if I've forgotten anything. I think that's the thing. Give us between two and three months, between two and three months, you, we will start electronic ticketing. That way, nobody will come to the station to buy tickets, and there will be no need for physical or social distancing. Thank you very much. Distinguished colleagues and gentlemen of the media, good afternoon to you all. Well, we have received tremendous amount of uh, emails and WhatsApp messages and phone calls and so on and so forth that we should open up uh, international flights. Um, and of course, we've taken it for granted that um, people understood that it's not a function of aviation alone. Otherwise, there would not have been a task force. So this is a function of a lot of MDAs, the function of government. And but um, National Air Transport Facilitation Committee has been established, which comprises of the following membership, Ministry of Aviation, Foreign Affairs, Health, Ministry of Culture and Tourism, Nigeria Civil Aviation Authority, Federal Airport Authority of Nigeria, Nigeria Customs, Nigeria Immigration, Nigeria Police, Nigeria Agricultural Quarantine Service, Ministry of Interior, the State Security Services, Nigerian Drug Law Enforcement Agency, Nigerian Airspace Management Agency, the Ground Handlers Association, the Freight Forwarders Association, um, the Air Operators uh, Certificate Representatives, Airline Operators of Nigeria Representatives, um, Nigerian Civil Aviation Security Committee, and the Airport Security Committee. They will be having their meeting tomorrow to further discuss the protocols as to open of the airports. Certainly, aviation is worst hit in this. There must be passenger movements, especially international passenger, for us to be able to survive. We've said here on this platform, the salaries are becoming difficult and difficult for us to pay. So we want to open more than you want to open. We daily live in with it. When are we going to open? But this is subject to so many factors. And all of this, all of the sacrifice that Ibishi is, ma is making um, is in the interest of the public, in the interest of all of us to stay safe. So therefore, government will not abdicate its responsibility of ensuring that we all stay safe. We definitely will, will open. I hear lots of arguments and that um, a lot of countries have opened. The last I checked, that most of the European countries, if not all, there is ban on us going there anyway. So also um, in the popular UAE and in America. But definitely we will open. There's also the Subcontinental Committee of West Africa, which we've been discussing since it's an economic union. Um, but we'll open. We'll open very soon when everything uh, seems to be okay and it's safe, and like I said, it's a function of a lot of MDAs. It's not only an aviation function. If it's us, we'll open yesterday. Because when we open, it means we make more money, we'll be able to carry on our activities, we pay our salaries and provide the service. So the purpose of us heading this is to, most respectfully I must say, is to be able to judge and find out what is safe for our citizens, for our country. So please bear with the situation. We feel your pain. We understand it as much as you do. We know that some people are cut away from their families. 
and they're cut away from their businesses. But this is an act of God. This is force majeure. Uh, so please, please bear with the situation. We are very responsible people. We will open when it is the right time to open. It, and I'm sure it will be sooner than later. Um, tomorrow, uh, like I said, this committee would meet. There's also a meeting at the Ministry of Interior, also where all of the stakeholders will also meet and discuss and uh, analyze and review the protocols. And they will be announced and it will open. This is the same similar way that we went to open the domestic flights, for example. Having opened the domestic flights, we found out that some of the airports, a few of the airports, weren't ready, and we didn't open them. But now, gladly, majority of them, over 80% of the airports are open. So therefore, international airport uh, travel would be open, and it will be soon. Then regarding the question of ev evacuation, we read uh, um, in social media and print and electronic media, people saying that um, in the guise of evacuation, we smuggle people in. It has nothing to do with that. I'm sure Minister of Foreign Affairs will um, respond to that uh, most efficiently. You cannot deny a citizen from coming back. If he wants to come back and he has a means of coming back, he will come back. But when he comes back, he will now, of course, respect the protocols that are put in place. So please be fair to us. Uh, we really honestly want to serve. We are actually serving in the best way that we think we should serve. And uh, we believe that we are doing the right thing. But of course, we would, um, we would listen we we'll always listen and we will tweak where we think that things are not going um, the way that they should go. So thank you very much indeed. We are still out there with our environmental health officers providing guidance and counseling uh, all the way down to the grassroots. I just want to reiterate and re-emphasize the fight is still raging on, but I will finish the balance in Hausa. Jama'a salamu alaykum. The Gama'a Qatar. Ministers, distinguished members of the press, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, at the ministry, uh, part of our strategy for the surging our uh, humanitarian and disaster management mandate is the deployment of early warning signals which help us ensure disaster management preparedness and mitigation. It also helps us in building resilience for the future, especially uh, post-COVID. Uh, the imperative of this has been underlined by the COVID-19 pandemic, especially in the light of the health, economic, and humanitarian toll it has taken on countries, uh, even developed countries across the globe. Uh, I would like to say that as the uh, raining season intensifies, we believe that the incidents of flooding will not just be disastrous and catastrophic, but they will also impoverish uh, vulnerable population who have been adversely affected by the pandemic and are uh, in their need uh, of uh, humanitarian interventions. Uh, we already have an inkling of where we can go wrong from the Nguagolada flooding incident, which was effectively contained by the Ministry to the National Emergency Management Agency. We have been drawing up for active attention of flood prone states uh, to the annual seasonal rainfall prediction released by the Nigerian Meteorological Agency on 24 January 2020 and the annual flood uh, outlook released by the Nigeria Hydrological Services Agency. Uh, two weeks ago, the Director General of NEMA was in Oka in the final phase of distribution of fertilizers and uh, relief materials to farmers affected by the 2019 flooding disaster in line with the President's Emergency Agricultural Intervention Program. Uh, we must not let this happen under this COVID-19 uh, uh, period. And that is why we're, we're being very proactive uh, to see that these uh, issues are you know, mitigated. To ensure preparedness based on early warning signals from NIMET and NISA, we are calling on all stakeholders, especially the state governments, 
in the flood prone areas to take the following uh, preemptive actions, uh, which is to ensure the preparedness of the state emergency management agency, frontline local government authorities, and other response agency, to also carry out public enlightenment campaigns targeting vulnerable communities uh, to undertake mitigation actions and prepare for evacuation to safer ground, to also identify high grounds for possible internally displaced persons camps to shelter and evacuated communities, the silt river channels and canals, remove all refuse, Organize a state humanitarian coordination forum meeting to prepare all stakeholders for the mitigation and response, as well as preposition of relief materials to these prompt uh, response uh, areas after incident. Uh, you may also recall that the NPower application portal opened to accept applications for intending batch C beneficiaries on Friday, June 26th. 2020 and was supposed to have closed yesterday, Sunday, July 26th. The application process will close now on Sunday, August 9, 2020, by giving a two weeks uh, extension. And this extension is to enable as many eligible applicants as possible to apply for the Empire program by providing an equitable and level playing field to all applicants. It also take into cognizance difficulties some people might have encountered in gaining access to the registration portal, which has been a record, which has seen a record number of over 5 million applications. At the Bar C, it has been stated on many occasions, provides an opportunity to train and upskill young Nigerians for employability or entrepreneurship. It is a proactive action as countries around the world gear up for post-COVID-19 economic revival. Sundry and ongoing humanitarian interventions in support of the vulnerable members of our population continue as we progress into phase two of the lockdown. Thank you very much. Uh, just to update you, all on the questions from last week, where I had indicated that stakeholders in the education industry or ecosystem will be rounding off their meetings today. By 2 p.m. today, all the state commissioners and governors have agreed that all schools will open in Nigeria from the 3rd of August. This is to prepare our students for WAIEC exams, which will begin on the 17th of August. Now, this varies the timetable we had indicated earlier by as much as two weeks. What the agreement entails is that WAIEC West Africa and all the countries that are in it have agreed that the exams will proceed, but that the exams that are peculiar to Nigeria will be taken from the 5th of September through to the 14th of September. The exams that are common to all the countries of West Africa will proceed as previously published on the 17th. Nigeria will then proceed to domesticate its own uh, timetable for the exams. This has today been accepted by every state in Nigeria and endorsed by the PTF today at our meeting. It is now up to those who are going for Salah to kindly eat meat carefully so that they will learn as is required. Revision classes begin from today. Good morning. He said, what is the ministry offering? All we said there is that we will make it mandatory that everybody will comply with the requirements of the PTF. Three meters, 
to buy a ticket. That's not Ministry of Transport. That's one of the requirements of PTF. Three meters when seated. We could have said, wear your mask, sit anyhow you like. But because we want to comply with the PTF directives, we said one person per seat of three, three benches. Now, you, so when you say, what am I bringing? That's what I'm bringing. Exactly. What does he want me to bring? The train and compliance with the law. That I was pressured to open, yes. Because I was imagining, I was imagining how to raise the money to run the rail by this time, when expenditure will be higher than income. And it's difficult for the ministry because it's not budgeted for. However, we had to run. We will not shut down even after COVID, even after, I mean, even after the, the, the celebration. We will not. We will continue to run. We will only shut down if we see that you are not complying with the requirements of the PTF committee. If you are not, in fact, if I go on Wednesday and you are not, we will shut down that same Wednesday. You can go and bring police. That same day we will shut down. For me, life is more important than running to, going to Kaduna and coming back. Ibaran to Kano, we are waiting for the loan. Once the, Chinese approves the loan approve, once the Chinese approve the loan, we'll commence work. But don't forget, it's not, it's not, going, to be, it's not going to be easy. We want to employ 10,000 workers. We can't employ 10,000 workers without spreading COVID. So we'll use the number of people we'll use at a time. And that's the problem we have in Lagos to Ibadan. We are, we are to complete Lagos to Ibadan by May. We finish the tracks. If you go there, you'll see that the tracks have gotten to Butemeta, double track. But the problem is, in terms of tracks, from Butemeta to Afapa Seaport. We're about laying the, the track from Afapa Seaport, I mean, from Butemeta to Afapa Seaport when COVID started. So we stopped. Now, I like to give this example all the time. You need 1,000 workers to complete the station at Ebute Meta. Now, only 10 persons go to work every day. So how many days do you need to complete the, the station that require 1,000 workers? However, work is continuing. This morning, we had a debate in the ministry. Should we start running Lagos Sibadan without completing the stations? Because actually, what you need is a track. So people can just walk in and walk straight to the train and go to Lagos Sibana. We're having that debate. We should be able to conclude before the end of the month. Why did we increase train fares? It's a choice. We can decide not to increase and then not run until, situations, until the situation improves. Or we run and increase the fare a bit to meet just the running cost, no profit, nothing. Like the last speaker who spoke, he said, my friend, and colleague is, is uh, what are you doing? Giving up palliatives. Please give me some transport some so that we can, we can bear the cost and reduce the cost of transportation. Ticket racketeering will stop. It is not because there is no e-ticketing that you have ticket racketeering. The reason why you have ticket racketeering is when you don't have enough coaches and locomotives. Now we have enough, we have a lot of locomotives. That's why we say before there were only four uh, train services. That's about eight in a day. Now we're offering you 14. So if anybody tells you you have ticket, don't buy. Because there are enough. We're going every one hour. There is enough, you have enough. In fact, we're bringing in a DMU from Lagos in the next two weeks. DMU will get to, will get to Kaduna in one hour 15, one hour 20 minutes. Speed train. And you have enough seats. There are 10 coaches. If we're not careful, we'll be running empty. We are, we are carrying 4,000 passengers in a day before COVID. We have, we have not provided for the 4,000 passengers in a day, if they, if, they, if they will be there. I think that's about the questions I was, I was asked. I don't know if, did I leave any? Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you, Minister of Transportation. We'll take the technical responses first. The Minister of Health followed by the DG NCDC and the National Coordinator. Honorable Minister of Health.
thank you uh, the questions uh, about uh, speech. Now, in 2018, Nigeria conducted the uh, National AIDS Im Indicator and Impact Survey. Nice. And we used that opportunity to also see uh, the prevalence of hepatitis in Nigeria. And at that time, it was determined that hepatitis B uh, is uh, present in 8.1% and hepatitis C in 1.1% of the population, that's the prevalence. Now, for those who do not know, hepatitis is uh, a disease of the liver. It's an inflammation of the liver, and caused by, in this case, caused by a virus, uh, just like a virus like, you know, a virus like uh, any other virus, uh, specific to the liver, and the types of virus uh, uh, ABC. So the Nigeria has been responding to the hepatitis uh, situation with vaccination since 2004. And it's provided by the NPHCDA, National Primary Health Care Development Agency. Uh, and the coverage as of uh, this year was 59%. So what we need to be able to do is to uh, expand the coverage by looking for more resources to uh, get uh, more vaccines and also more uh, opportunities for immunization and reaching those areas that have not been reached, particularly the hard to reach areas. So yes, the NPHCD is the one, not the, not the NHIS, is the, that is the one conducting that uh, program of uh, vaccination. Now, the other question is about the testing centers. Uh, yes, the our plan is to have all hospitals, general hospitals and federal hospitals as sample collection sites. Uh, but we can't guarantee that all of them will be able to do that at night. We are encouraging them to have a holding area, to have the facilities that will um, enable for uh, bring human resources to be trained and they'll be given the necessary wherewithal the personal protective equipment and the sample and the kits and a mechanism for recovery of sample samples collected. But surely anybody who has any symptoms should endeavor to go for testing by daytime. Uh, things slow down by night. But I can assure you that uh, places that with high burden and high specification like uh, National Hospital and uh, also, uh, uh, the uh, University of Abuja Teaching Hospital in Guagualada may be in a position to conduct such tests, uh, I mean, to take samples uh, uh, at, at all times. But uh, that's not something so urgent that you have to wake up at one o'clock in the night to go and test, except you have symptoms, you are very sick, in which case you can go to known areas where you can be put in a holding room and uh, until a test can be done. And we are hoping, uh, or rather our plan, is to make sure that the point of care, the major points of care, have a PCR machine, a gene expert machine, so that they can do their own tests once patients uh, with, who are suspected to have COVID appear. So you don't have to take a swab and then wait for, for days for your result to come, so we are, put that one quite clearly in our plans to have the major treatment centers uh, be equipped with their own point of care uh, diagnostic machine, which is generally the uh, faster operating uh, gene expert machine. But again, I will use the opportunity to urge all citizens, if you test positive and you're over a certain age, let's say 50, or you have comorbidities that you know about go and register your presence somewhere in any of the teaching, any of the treatment centers. And uh, uh, if for any reason you haven't done that and you feel any symptoms, do not wait until the next day. Do not say, okay, you wait until later. Go immediately to a well-known, to a treatment center and register your presence in there so that you don't fall into distress at an odd hour and uh, then you are looking at that time for uh, help 
when things slow down, things tend to slow down at night. So that is the advice for all citizens to enable us reduce the case fatality rate uh, for even further. Thank you. Uh, our target actually was uh, to test 2 million by the end of this month. But always remember, the purpose of testing is not necessarily the target itself. The purpose of setting a target is to mobilize action towards that goal. When we set that target, we had many states that were resisting testing. Now, every state in Nigeria is at least coming forward to test, every single state. We have 60 labs across the country. We've activated gene expert uh, sites. We have 60 sites all together. So yes, we're not yet at that target, but what we've done is mobilize the entire country uh, towards this. And remember, like I said last week, the test in itself is not the end. The test is a window into a spectrum of both clinical care and public health that is now mobilizing itself across the country uh, to improve the response. So yes, we haven't met the target collectively. It's a Nigerian target, it's not an NCDC target. Uh, but I think what that target has done is focus our minds on what needs to be done in order to respond to this outbreak. A link to that is the question on the numbers appearing to come down a bit. Uh, it's too early to interpret whether we're seeing a plateauing. Yes, the numbers fluctuate between 500 and 700 every day. Uh, sometimes we see a bit more. But remember, even though we report this as one outbreak, there are really several clusters of cases happening. The only state where we have seen a consistent trend is in Lagos. In many other states, uh, you know, we see, we've seen increases and decreases at different points depending on a series of activities. Uh, ability to test, um, something definitely happened at Kano, in Kano at some point, and we got over that, apparently. Uh, so there are continuous investigations going on and efforts to understand the outbreak in the different parts of the country. But remember, even though we report this as a single outbreak, it really is not a single outbreak. These are different uh, drivers of transmission in different parts of the country. So we need to look at it in a slightly more differentiated part. In some places, numbers are still increasing. In others, they are stabilizing. And in some places, we may be at the beginning of a decrease. But the key message is to keep pushing. Thank you. Uh, we um, liaised uh, with the NNPC and their partners um, with regards to uh, taking some of these hospitals up. Um, of course, they will all require some degree of renovation and equipping, as we all know, um, um, not all hospital structures are fit for purpose when it comes to infection control. Uh, in this regard, um, the NMPC and its partners were able to identify six hospitals in six states, uh, choosing hospitals that had 50 to 100 beds. Um, they are in the process of uh, uh, considering them for renovation and equipping before handing over to the state um, task force. Now, this is because generally the NMPC group uh, are concentrating on uh, greenfield hospitals, i.e. hospitals uh, that are new infection-related hospitals, um, but um, we may still come back to the Catholic uh, mission uh, when, th when these um, hospitals have been renovated. But having said th this, I think it's worth um, remembering that we have more than 7,000 isolation beds across the country, um, but not all states, such as Lagos, for instance, have saturated their bed capacity. Across the country, only about 60% of our isolation beds are occupied. Uh, this is because some states do not have a lot of cases, and others have too much. Um, Lagos, for instance, have overrun their capacity for isolation a long time ago and that is why they are concentrating on home-based care. But there are states that um, are hardly using their isolation facilities. Uh, we also have a large number of um, um, isolation treatment centers that were set up through um, the CARCOVID arrangement, um, i.e. the private sector. Uh, just recently, we have the Abuja Dome that has been commissioned and is now operational. 
Um, so in terms of capacity, I think for a lot of states, we still have capacity. But we'll still continue to um, accept and work with those charitable organizations that continue to assist uh, the COVID response. Uh, in terms of the questions with uh, regards to number of people on ventilators, on average, we have between three to five persons on ventilators throughout the country. So you do the maths. How many cases do you have on average? That will give you the answer. Um, so in, in essence, we don't have a lot of people on ventilators in the country. We have 265 beds that we can use for ventilation. But we have, on average, not more than five. As I said last week, I believe we had about five patients on ventilators. Um, I'm not going to go into the possible causes or reasons for that. Guidelines to states, Amaka, I think you asked whether we were communicating with the states with regards to some of our guidelines, um, such as the one that I've just read out. Well, uh, all our guidelines are, as you know, published um, in newspapers. They are also published online, including our State House website. Uh, we also have direct link with the state governments. Some of the guidelines that we write, we actually correspond with them and discuss with them. We have a representative of the Nigeria Governors Forum uh, in the PTF as part of the pillar he heads, one of the pillars we have. So communication with states is not really a major issue. Just like you have access to the guidelines, they, it's very easy for them. All they need to do is to link up through the Nigeria Governors Forum. But as we've said in the past, what we are providing is a baseline. States can do more. They should not do less, preferably, but they can do more than what we have put forward as a sort of, we, we provide the foundation, the minimum required to ensure uh, safety for, for people, uh, for, our, for our citizens. Okay, local government areas, yes, we have 11 high burden local government areas that we've identified. We are, we are doing a lot of work in these local governments, especially as it relates to risk communication and community engagement um, activities. We are also trying to improve testing, particularly in Lagos, where seven of the 11 local governments are. Um, we are improving case management. We are discussing with the various states in terms of uh, improving um, access to, to care, access to oxygen, etc. So the precision lockdowns are only one of various options. The main problem we have with lockdowns in these areas is the geographical nature of the local governments. So, for instance, Lagos, if we were to lock up those seven local governments, we'll have to lock down um, uh, the entire state. Uh, states like Bielsa as well, Yanagoa, which is a local government that has a high burden. If we lock down Yanagoa, um, virtually all the uh, roads that go f across the state have to go through this, this local government. So, technically, it will be very difficult, but as we know, if, if um, the interventions that we propose are being implemented and people are cooperating. You don't actually need to lock down people at all. Um, it will still work. So, but that brings us to the issue of um, non-adherence to non-pharmaceutical interventions. Um, just this week, over the weekend, uh, we had to take action in some parts of the FCT where there were issues uh, with enforcement, particularly Saturday evening. And we will continue to do this through the law enforcement agencies. You ask Amaka if, um, we should be criminalizing and non-wearing of face masks. Um, so as you know, for a lot of the state gov governments, they actually already have acts in place uh, for non-wearing of face masks. Um, but of course, we don't know how many people have been brought to book. Um, personally, when I come across somebody who is not wearing a face mask um, in front of me, I will challenge them. Because when you wear a face mask, you're actually protecting more of the person you're meeting or you're with than protecting yourself. So in other words, we should be challenging those that repeatedly flout um, our non-pharmaceutical interventions and our rules um, as regards personal safety. And um, certainly we would, um, would um, it's particularly important at this time as we go into Salah for people going into large mass gatherings without face mask, uh, really, you are putting at risk everybody. And uh, it's just not right. Um, behavioral change will come with a change in risk perception, but sometimes you also need a communal involvement. We have to be in this all together. It's all about uh, all of us 
deciding that this is what is acceptable socially and culturally, and this is what is not acceptable. It's all about cultural change, and it requires all of us to work together and convince those doubters that are still out there that by wearing a, a, a face mask, you are actually doing something good to your, to your, to your community and to your people. Um, finally, importation of cases. So I'm not sure whether you are referring to the diplomatic community here or not, um, but um, um, our current policy states quite clearly that if you are boarding to come to Nigeria, you need a negative PCR result. When you arrive, we will still test you. There's a small cohort that we do not test for, um, for, 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 for specific reasons, but what we have actually been seeing is that even for those that we test, about 10% in Abuja and uh, um, a larger percentage, up to 20% in Lagos, when retested, turn out to be positive. So we don't know whether it's the quality, quality of the test that they have outside the country that is poor, i.e. maybe there's, we have, um, uh, they have quality assurance issues, or people are just getting fake results and, tra and traveling with it. But either way, as we go into the next phase of opening up international airports, we will take a decision as to whether we should be testing pre or testing on arrival. There are about 10 countries that um, test, um, uh, ask for testing on arrival, about 15 countries worldwide currently that uh, request for some sort of certificate, et cetera, for testing. But um, the majority, I can assure you that the majority of persons that come into the country, whether or not they have a PCR result, will be tested. And we know, we know their status. Um, the uptake is much better, of course, in Abuja than Lagos, but we are working on Lagos, and I'm very confident over the next few days, uh, by early next week, most of the Lagos um, issues would have been resolved. Thank you. What is your question? Mm -hmm. You would want to know how many people on ventilators have died. So I don't have that figure, but I can tell you, even in the best environments, even in the UK, for instance, if you go onto a ventilator, your chances of dying is more than 50%. So it's pretty high. It's very high. You are best not to go on a ventilator if it can be managed. But once you go on a ventilator, in some countries it's more than 60%, even in countries with advanced health systems. So that's my answer. Yes, we know how many persons I don't have the data on how many of them. Case management, this is actually Federal Ministry of Health. It isn't a PTF issue. Thank you. In, in Nigeria, well, the, our statistics so far is that less than 2% of people have required ventilators. Less than 2 yet have used ventilators. Nobody dies from ventilators. The, the, the ventilator is supposed to save, but the point is that the, the, the use of it is not as much as we had thought. And in other countries, uh, it turns out that they use ventilators a lot. But, and so we put at the beginning the focus on procuring ventilators. But the experience we have had is that we have only 2% have actually required, and the majority have been okay with oxygen supplementation. So we just use oxygen concentrators more. That's why we are putting more emphasis on procuring the oxygen concentrators and the ventilators haven't come in as frequently as we thought at the beginning. And it's consistent with the, with the evolving pattern of this COVID and the way it manifests in different places probably, but science still has to rule out why so many, not so many people require ventilators here in Nigeria. Uh, so the use has been very low. Uh, and in Lagos has reported that they're okay with supplementation, just giving oxygen, that's all. So we are looking at oxygen tent, that you have a, a room that is loaded with oxygen, and then uh, people can uh, go inside uh, and uh, have the higher oxygen concentration they're looking for. 
So it's a clinical question for case management. Yes. Okay. What we said is that the schools that will be reopening are schools that are centers for these exams and only in respect of the exiting classes. Primary schools and all other classes are excluded from this decision-making process. We arrived at this decision, like I explained, having met um, with all the stakeholders. Part of what they will update us with on Friday, on the, 20, on the on 29th, our cut off date is 29th, which is uh, three days time, in two days time, will be for them to report back as to their state of preparedness on the 29th. The state of preparedness of each of these centers will inform how they open. Um, I'm in discussions with my brother, the Minister of Environment, and we are also awaiting at the Minister of Education. Wherever we see gaps in their state of preparedness, we will address and help uh, get in there. If it is not possible, then we will not be able to use them. But all the state governors and state commissioners of education and all the other stakeholders, association of private school owners, have all given us their commitment that they will try to resolve this, provide for the teachers. WAEC will also provide for their invigilators and make sure that this conduct is seamless. Uh, before I go into the part about private schools, uh, private universities, let me just take a minute to recap what I've explained in Igbo language for the purpose of the question I'm uh, the sentence from Voice of Nigeria. Ubunem Nandem Omande Nigeria. Anna Kawana Ubochule Wayek Agamalitiana Mbong Onwa Ogo Osubara Iria Bale Irina Sa. I gave you do Ilula Ruo Mbongwa September Gaba Obochi Irini Irina no. Oberani, Kangota, no no la ji bidu bua, quadue. I na padoka ula kuni ne ndi kweshri isonula. Kahe bidu, hede kana onwa ogos mbobara uba chato. Mepe ju la kukonda geji were gawa henda. Onyo wula patranya kaha mwa kuku bua iji more for man who lena bia bia, or yam ranger more car, uba. Ula kuponi nege wen quadobe. I nandi governor. Nandi wo nena homaka kuma kuponuna state or wola di chiche, e kuluku. Quakreta, na huba. I am popular nandi wayek. Na lekwe henda in quakreta. I get me kwenu timetable can the Nigeria. Can may adjust to talk a she on your lagota nimia. Oya we hem kawaga. I come back to English. Private universities. Yes, um, I'm in receipt of the letter. We have acknowledged it at the Ministry of Education. I have asked the Executive Secretary at the Nigerian Universities Commission to investigate their claim. When we get a response and a state of what, how they are at at the moment, a comment on that state, we will revert as to our position on that. However, we are aware that many of the private universities and a few of our public universities are able to continue with their online engagements. We are encouraging them to continue to do that. We are looking at all the suggestions they have made. They are very um, uh, well taken uh, suggestions, and we will use that in formulating a work plan that does not just only affect them, but affect the rest of the country. We do not want to uh, continuously keep 
some people behind in order to make things work. But we are also mindful that we are running a country and it must be as inclusive as possible. So um, in the next few weeks, uh, a few days, we'll be making th that adjudication and we'll revert to all private university owners via the appropriate channels. Thank you very much. The first question was uh, about the promising vaccines. Um, what I can say is that uh, as of uh, 24th of uh, June, um, WHO has recorded 25 candidate vaccines. Uh, I want to emphasize they are candidate vaccines and not promising vaccines. To decide whether they were promising or, promising or not, uh, as you know, WHO has a, a strategic advisory group of experts on vaccines and immunization. Um, after those 25 candidate vaccines, will finalize the clinical evaluation on the way now. Um, that expert group will be able to review the evidence and advise the WHO Director General whether we could consider any of them as promising so that it could go to next stage. The same applies for drugs, for treatment. As you know, WHO has launched the solidarity trial and invited the country to join and evaluate different regimens. And the disease is still new. We are still learning. Many therapeutic regimens are being tested. And uh, at some point, the expert group in WHO will revise the evidence and also advise on uh, whether they should be included formally into the treatment guideline for COVID-19. COVID-19 is a disease. It's not a bacteria. It's a disease caused by a virus called coronavirus. That virus is transmitted from infected person through droplet. When a person speaks, cough, or sneezes. That's why it's very important to consistently wear mask, face mask, when in public, and observe other non-pharmatical interventions. Uh, when is Africa expected to peak in infection? The review of trends so far shows that we are still on an ascend ascending trend. The disease is still being transmitted actively. Most of African countries have community transmission firmly established. That's why it's important we continue to observe measures addicted by the, the government. And I would like to reiterate the message uh, shared or given by Dr. Tedros, our Director General. He says we should treat COVID-19 as any time we need to, we have to decide on what to do, we should treat that decision as a life or death decision, because that's what it is. If I know that Going through this pathway, I'm likely to find a lion on my way, then I shouldn't take it. If I want to go to a crowded place, I need to think twice. When I need to go out, I need to go out when it's very, really necessary. So it's very important that all of us, we be aware of that. The disease is still being transmitted actively and we need to work together in Nigeria, in Africa, to suppress community transmission to be able to control the disease. Thank you. An announcement that uh, today we lifted the ban on executive air services limited. Um, they have complied substantially with all of our imposed sanctions they paid part of the fines and they brought out payment plan. So we have lifted the ban today so they continue to do their business. As these type of things are not punitive, they are things to make our industry work better and keep all of you safe.
Secondly, as the VIP offenders, well, quote unquote, which is undergoing investigation, the report will be on my desk this week. Hopefully, I will keep you posted. And thank you very much, Hassan, for the question. Whether I'm confident that aviation will bounce back, uh, having been worst hit by COVID-19, the answer is yes. Unfortunately for us in aviation, we've seen our fair share of uh, impacts due one or another thing. Globally, you all remember in the early 70s, the oil crisis. You remember the Iran-Iraq war. You also remember the Gulf War. Um, I remember the Asian crisis. Remember the 9-11? Remember the SARS? Remember? Remember the world recession? All this meltdown and so on, which impacted all of it on aviation seriously. But it only left a little dent. Uh, as my late uncle would say, may Allah forgive him, Malay Inodusi, he would say that the world is driven by two things. By travel, which is by legs, and by mouth, which is communication. So there will always be need for traveling. And aviation will certainly bounce back, uh, especially if the roadmap that we are diligently pursuing and all of the support that we're getting from government and private sector, it's uh, followed to the letter. We're sure that aviation will come back. And also from history, right from the early 1920s till date, aviation will always double every 15 years. So we, we, we hope that it will continue because that has been the uh, trajectory despite all of these uh, world recession, uh, meltdown, 9-11, Iran-Iraq war, and, and so on and so forth, including 9-11. So thank you very much. With this question asked by Amaka about the need to criminalize uh, breaches of the non-pharmaceutical measures uh, that have been put in place. I have uh, stated quite often that the operations of the mobile courts are vested within the jurisdiction of the states and the FCT. But they are the ones that have those responsibilities when they sign their quarantine laws. Part of what is contained in the laws are uh, what would happen to cases of breaches. We have a challenge of enforcement in this country. Uh, if you criminalize the use of face masks in the city of Abuja, uh, I don't know where you will send the people to. There are too many criminals walking around. Because the level of non-compliance uh, with the use of face mask or any form of covering is rather, unfortunately, very, very high. Very, very high. And honestly, it's, it's a major cause for anxiety and concern. Because that's the easiest way that you can stop this transmission. And it's the one that is most resisted. For no justifiable reason, but it's just resisted. And I think we will continue to drive home the point. We will continue to uh, implore our people, cajole them, do whatever we need to do for the message to resonate with our people that it is very, very important that in our evaluation of the risk associated with COVID-19, we personalize that evaluation. I'm glad with the comments of the, with Dr. Olombo, the new country rep, where he re-echoed what the Director General of the World Health Organization has kept emphasizing that our perception of the risk involved in COVID-19 
will be what eventually guide our response. And the simple example he gave is, uh, if you are going to take this path and you know that you are going to be confronted by a lion which might devour you, would you take that path? Obviously, any sensible person will not take that path. It's the same thing. If you have to go out in the public space and the probability of contracting COVID-19 is 90% if you do not wear your mask. It's your perception of that risk that will determine what you will do. Whether you will wear the mask or you will just will reckless abandon, what I have always called reckless confidence, which is on the rise and being exhibited on a daily basis by our people. Don't stop on your various platforms, your television stations, your radio stations, your newspapers, don't stop. Cascade in the message that the non-pharmaceutical interventions that have been put in place and that are being promoted by government, wearing of masks in public places, keeping social distancing, sanitizing or washing of your hands, and if you do not have any business going out, stay at home, are the only known procedures now that will help you and guide and guard you against contracting COVID-19. Liberty, you have asked me to speak in Hausa, particularly to, to speak about the dangers that lie ahead, particularly as we go into the pre, uh, season of uh, the Salah celebrations. So, Jamaa, in so in Kawo one and Kuka the Bamuria, Nachewa Abunda Mukagano, the one and Chutan coronavirus, Ayanzu, Shini Akanchewa, Anirashi, Narayu Kakusan, the Ritakos, the Hamsan, the Takos, and Nigeria. Kashi Bu Bisa Uku. Na mutane nda suka rasuda nda so dan kaili safi madaka sa muke dan kusam mutane da rishida mutane ne wanda shekarun su ya bayana cikin shekaru hansun da sama muna shiri na wannan buki salla buki na ibada kira nake yi da babban murya an shekarun ka sun kai wannan kana da kuma wadansu cuta kafin ma corona virus ta zo ina kira da babban murya ba sai ka je sallan idi ba ba sai ka shiga cikin jama'a ba kana iya adua asararin gidanka dun akan lisafin da muke da shi yanzu kamar inda na fada kashi biyu bisa uku na mutanen da suka mutu a Najeriya kusan 600 kenan daga 858 din mutane ne wadanda shekarun su ya kai 50 da sama kuma mutane ne wanda suke da wadansu cuta kafin corona virus ta zo so the gaskiya kuma rokon da muke yi bisa wannan lokacin da za a shiga na ibada din nan kamar yadda sarkin musulmi ya fada muna da daje da jawa akan cewa ai hattara ba lokaci bane na shawagi ba lokaci bane na bubuwa lokaci ne wanda ya kamata mutane su yi hankali su yi aiki kuma da kokolwa su na dauki mata kai wanda ya kamata in ma za ka fita in ma za ka je masallaci ka sa face mask face mask din nan dalilin da yasa muke rokan mutane su sa corona cutan da ta zo yanzu din nan har yanzu ba maganin ta makariyanka shine ka sa face mask 
First month, I'm coming to Lily. The same way, Roka Muta and the Susashi. I can't show up. In Kato Homio, in Kaitari, in Canada, Chutang, one and in Kelang, they tarry it up. But I can't yard as she har mutiminka. They keep kusa da kai ko dan wanka ko dan ka ko iyalin ka su kamu da wannan cutan ba dalilin da yasa muke roka kenan kowa ya sata don ba an rufta akan a goshin wuni ga bai corona ba ba za ka san wanda yake kamuwa da ida ba akwai wadanda ake kira su asymptomatic mutun zai kamu da shi ma har ya samu sauki ya warke be sha magani ba amma yana yada ta muka ce kuma karan mutane su cin kusu a wannan lokacin akwai abin da ake kiranta social distance a tsaya ka fada da ka fada kar a cin kusu kuma dole dan ka fita ko yaushe ka fita ka wanke hannunka ko ka nemi sanitizer abin nan da ake sa a buta ana pesawa a hannu ana 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 tsarkake hannu da shi in ba ya zama dole ba kai zaman ka gidanka kar ma ka karbi baki yanzu ina cikin wata na ko dan wata hudu ba da karban baki a gidana ba ya zama dole ba in karbi baki ba tunda ina fita ina mahara da mutane in kuma in koma kuma a gida kuma mutane su zo su cika mani gida cinkus corona virus har yanzu yana da dafin ta dafin ba ta rabu ba don mun rage muka ce a fita mutane wanda suke da hannu da cunyi su je su nemi abinci corona ba za ta rage mana ba a yau a kasashen duniya gabaki daya mun kai mutane sun kai miliyan 16 wanda sun kamu da wannan cuta fiye da rabi miliyan sun mutu dan ba mun dauki matakai ba na abubuwan da muke fadi muna rokan jama'a yi din nan ba za a ci gaba da kamuwa da cutan kuma za a ci gaba ana mutuwa wanda da ya kamata mu dauki matake na kare shi ina fata jama'a za su yi hattara za su ji wannan rokon nan da muke yi ba mu na so mu toza ta jama'a bane muna rokan jama'a ne don kare rayuwar mu da kare rayuwar iyalan mu da kare rayuwar mutanen kasar Najeriya na gode muku Thank you very much, Chairman PTF. That brings us to um, a couple of reminders from what we have been saying today. Uh, COVID-19 is killing people in their thousands all over the world. Over 16 million cases, over 600,000 deaths. It is hard to put our lives on hold, but we need all our energies to take control of our societies and our future. Please take responsibility, change your behavior, join the fight, and take it seriously. Get tested if you feel the symptoms, and get help. Do not wait. Analysis has shown that people over 50 years of age remain most at risk. So far, they have accounted for 65% of all fatalities in Nigeria. Cumulatively, we have 858. If you have underlying factors and you are within that age bracket, please take compliance very seriously. Stay home, observe the measures. If you feel the symptoms, seek help. Let us protect our senior citizens. As we approach Salah, remember to, to wear your masks. Remember to stay safe. We have a shared responsibility to stay safe and to protect our loved ones and our communities. And as long as COVID-19 is active, we all remain at risk. It does not discriminate. Until we get a vaccine, we must play safe. This is why we are asking all citizens to weigh our decisions properly. It is a matter of life and death. Finally, do not stigmatize. But do not be afraid of any stigmatization. It is not a death sentence. Join the risk communication effort. 
treat COVID-19 as a matter of life and death and avoid it at all costs. I thank you very much. God bless Nigeria. We hope to see you on Thursday because reaching out to you, telling you the true situation is a 30 hour business in a 24 hour day. So we must always reach you. We are not going on holidays. I thank you very much.